So why don't we start off with understanding why you decided to write a book about underdogs? Because I don't want to bury the lead here. That is the lead. You wrote The Underdog Paradox, available everywhere. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why you decided to do just that. Yeah, it's it's funny you ask it the way you have, because a lot of people, when I announced the book, thought that I was writing a book about myself. And that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the, the people that I, I share stories about in my book are actually uh, people that have inspired me uh, in my own life and were people that I thought needed to have their stories told to a larger audience to inspire others too. Um, so why, why the underdog paradox? So a year and a half ago, um, I was working at a, at a company in my dream job and ended up um, through the kind of course of a crazy business environment, ended up getting laid off alongside a number of different team members. And I was kind of sitting there on my last day, handing in my computer and realizing, like I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do next. And I was just reflecting on a lot of my own personal life experiences in that moment and thinking to myself, wow, like there's been a lot of people that I have had the opportunity to work with that have inspired me to do anything that I want to do because they have been the type of people that have pursued their passions. And so uh, without giving too much away, the, the, the people that I talk about in my book are the people that I have worked with through a number of uh, startup accelerators, a number of incubators, a number of uh, nonprofits, uh, people that have overcome extraordinary adversity in their own personal lives prior to starting a business. And I don't talk about really their businesses. I talk about them as people. Uh, I talk about their own, their own personal life experiences that have molded them and why they're tackling the problems that they're tackling. Um, the types of problems that these individuals are, are tackling are anything from mass incarceration to world peace to uh, you know, solving some medical mysteries and the types of things that no one would do unless you've walked a million miles in these people's shoes. Um, so I, I just couldn't be more excited because the underdog story is always something that I have been really personally inspired by. Um, and I, I think right now in, in, in this you know, point in time where we are, um, I think so many people need to kind of dig deep and find that like inner, inner strength to be able to persevere through uh, anything difficult, whether it's finding a new job or overcoming a difficult time at work during uh, COVID-19 or, or anything like that. I think it's really resonated with a lot of people. You mentioned that you met these people and you, you were like, oh, I need to write a book about, I need to write about them. But when was the point? It must have been different points. But when was the point that you decided, okay, I need to compile all these into a book? That is, is the path that I want to go down because I was reading these stories and I'm like, how did Jamie meet these people? Like, I know you mentioned it briefly in startup accelerators and stuff like that, but talk to me about meeting them and then realizing that, oh my God, this is going to be in a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so uh, the company that I was working at, WeWork, uh, I, I was essentially employee number one in Washington, D.C. for a new program called WeWork Labs. And WeWork Labs is like a micro community within WeWork for early stage startups. And my job was basically to recruit early stage companies and come join our community and help them grow their business. And when I was trying to figure out how to position WeWork Labs in the market, I was in Washington, DC at the time, I was really thinking to myself, like how can I identify a particular niche that will enable us to stand out from all of the other programs for startups uh, in DC and really in the country for that matter. Um, and the niche that I ended up targeting is a niche for social entrepreneurs, for people that are building business as a force for positive change. The reason for that, there's a, a really great hub and community in Washington, DC for these types of ventures. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of nonprofits in Washington, D.C., a lot of government money in Washington, D.C. That's one. Um, there's also a lot of like uh, really smart people uh, that are really passionate and really mission driven, like all placed in like one small kind of corner of the country. And so in doing so, I ended up getting the opportunity to meet so many people that were tackling such important world issues. The, the first person that I talk about in my book, his name is Luol Mayen. He's a 25-year-old former refugee from South Sudan who's building video games for peace and social impact. And Luol's story really resonated with me um, after I heard about him from a friend who had been like mentoring him for three months through uh, a program at the U.S. Peace Institute. And 
Luol, Luol is someone who spent the first 22 years of his life grow, growing up in a refugee camp in northern Uganda. Um, and for those first 22 years of his life, never thought that there was going to be any opportunity for him outside of, outside of that community. Um, Luol's mother fled the civil war in South Sudan on foot uh, and traveled 200 miles alone in search of a place of refuge. And upon arriving at the border of northern Uganda, she bore a son. And that was Luol. So, you know, Luol, Luol is somebody who, by no intents and purposes, has ever been handed any advantage ever in his entire life. And this idea that I play around with in my book is this idea that a lot of people oftentimes say that being an underdog is one of the greatest, greatest competitive advantages that there is. Um, but that that's really kind of almost a privileged way of thinking about this sometimes. Um, Luol saw his first computer when he was 13 years old. Um, Luol asked his mother, like, what it was. You know, standing there at a ref refugee registration center, she told him, like, that's a computer. And he said, I would like one. And I, I think one of the things that Luol has taught me is when you're a refugee, one of the greatest things that you can have is hope. And so rather than destroying her son's dreams, Luol's mother saved money for three years working as a seamstress and sewing bed sheets and saved enough money to buy her son a computer. And Luol, I mean, what, what are you going to do with a computer? He, he had to walk three hours every single day just to charge the thing. You know? That was the craziest part <laughs> of the story to me. And, and uh, kind of on one of those fateful journeys, one day somebody downloaded for him a CD-ROM on his computer. And on that CD-ROM was Grand Theft Auto Vice City. And he starts playing this game. And he's like, this thing is incredible. Like, what happened? Did this thing like fall from heaven? Where did it come from? Um, just because, I mean, you know, where he grew up, they played cards, they played soccer. Um, you know, he knew that kids loved games, but he had never seen anything like this before in his life. And he knew, he noticed a couple of things. He noticed number one, that these, these games were something that young people loved. Also, he noticed that the game itself was very violent, kind of violent in the way that he thought about the place where he had come from in South Sudan, conflict and he thought to himself, like, can I use games to teach young people not about conflict, but about conflict resolution or peace or putting people in the shoes of refugees and teaching other people what it's like being like me. And so he taught himself how to build games. He, bought his, he built his first video game in a refugee camp as a 16 year old. And um, after, you know, posting that game on his Facebook page, his story went viral in the indie gaming community. And that's you know, what brought him all over the world to various different conferences to speak about his, his journey and building games for peace, which is very different than everything else in the industry. And that's what brought him to Washington DC and the US Peace Institute. And that's where I met him. Um, and I, I think like the reason I really wanna be able to share stories like his is because having the opportunity to work with him for two years was something that gave me so much energy and gave me such perspective on the world. And I, I really wanted to share not just Luol's story, but the stories of others that are like him that have overcome such extraordinary obstacles in their own personal lives that no matter what they try to take on next in their life, in, the, in this journey, like there's nothing that's going to stop them. I'm curious, why did you decide to focus on five people as opposed to just Luol's story and write a whole book about Luol? You know, because that is a movie. That's a Hollywood movie right there. And yeah. it's just like, and the other stories are also incredible in their own way. I'm like, this could be five books. Oh my God, this is crazy. Like, you know, so yeah. Talk to me about why you decided to, I guess, put the book the way you did. Yeah, a, a couple of things. So number one, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Actually, when I was pitching this idea, to all of the, the people and the characters in my book, I, I told them, I was like, I know that I, I know that you deserve your own book. I know that you deserve multiple books. <laughs> I know that there's going to be movies about you. Um, but I, I, I wanted to connect the dots between different stories so that I could better identify what were the intangibles that made these individuals so special. And I could have certainly told Luol's story and woven in some really beautiful things about why he possesses so many intangibles that make him this magnetic figure and you know, whether we call it the it factor or something else, he's got something there. Um, but I, I wanted to connect the dots between him and others. Mm. And so 
I very purposefully chose the five people in my book. I mean, I, you know, interviewed hundreds of people for this book, but really the five people that I ended up selecting were five of the best representative examples that I could find of the core principles that I thought embodied the underdog mindset. And so whether it's grit or resilience or hope, like all of these people embody all of these principles in such a beautiful way. And I thought it was such a more powerful way to be able to share that rather than diving in deep on, on one personal story that certainly can be made into multiple documentaries, connecting all the dots between them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I What I liked particularly about the book is the way in which you showed multiple sides. The example that sticks out to my head is, is the way you showed Steph Curry in one instance as a privileged individual. And you said, yes, this is true. And then you also showed him as an underdog and you said, this is also true. And I like the way that you played those dichotomies together as well as showing both of those sides of the story, because I think another author or someone else might have just highlighted one of that those points. Like, look, Steph Curry is privileged or yes, he's an underdog, but you were able to interweave that together. So yeah, I thought that was incredible. I think I think the the main message that I want to get across to everybody through this book is no matter who you are or where you're from or what you want to be, we all have the power inside of ourselves to create things. And it doesn't matter whether you were born with uh, with nothing or a silver spoon. Like we all have the ability to channel an underdog mindset in a certain way. And and I think that's that's something that's very special. That I, I think a lot of people that make it to the top or like what what a lot of people consider to be the top. Um, I think a lot of people channel that that mindset day in and day out. And uh, like an, another example I'll give in addition to Steph Curry is like the story almost of like Jeff Bezos. And I, I don't go into detail on this one in the book, but like Jeff Bezos, you know, richest man or second richest wealthiest man in the world these days. Um, you know, he constantly reminds people that he comes from an immigrant family from Cuba and like makes that part of his personal story and leverages that to inspire himself and, you know, keep himself grounded um, while also like, putting that chip on his shoulder and like reaching further and further and further. So I, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can think about this. Um, but certainly all of us have the ability to channel that mindset in, in a way that gets us to the next level. You mentioned the top just now, like what some people would consider the top. Do you view the top as something different than the normal definition of the top? Yeah, great question. I, I think we are living in a really interesting age. And I think we are, we're living in a period where maybe people are no longer measuring success based on wealth alone. Um, I think for a long time, um, the, the pursuit of the American dream and like this idea of like capitalism, like rules the world, this is like something that I've really wrestled with over the last couple of years is like, what are the what are the core principles like what are, what is important today in this day and age to, to young people and i think we see that changing like right before our eyes in in moments like this um so for me i i, I don't have a, a personal definition of what success looks like to me but what i do know is my definition my definition of success is different from Danny Miranda's, is different from Steph Curry's, is different from Jeff Bezos, is different from Luol Mayen. And what's what's beautiful about that is I, I get to you know, create my own rules. I, I get to craft my own journey. I get to celebrate the things that I think are big to me um, and not have to compare myself against anyone else. And, and I think that version or definition of success is a, a really powerful thing, especially as a as a content creator, because it's so easy to get, uh, it's so easy to get stuck on like impressions and followers and all of those other vanity metrics um, that maybe aren't necessarily as important as like some of our own personal growth or you know achieving some of our own uh, our own goals or our over our, our own versions of success. Um, so yeah, I I don't have a definition, Danny, but I, I would definitely say I, I highly encourage everyone to create their own definition of of what that top looks like. Yeah. And one of the things that you've prided yourself on, on Twitter is finding friends instead of followers. And that's something that I just think of you. And I think of that saying, and where did that come from? That desire to make friends instead of just try to up your vanity metrics. I pro it probably has been formed by a lot of different things, but uh, this, 
the story that this ties back to is after I left WeWork, I handed in my computer and realized like, I, 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 I no longer had a personal computer. <laughs> like, I was like, what am I gonna do? Like I literally, am, am I gonna start applying to jobs? Like, how many, so I go to the Apple store and, uh, and the guy asked me like, oh, like, what do you need this computer for? Like, what are you gonna be doing with it? He was trying to like figure out what technology I needed. And I told him, I was like, I think I wanna be a writer. And I don't know where that came from, but I kind of like had this goal in the back of my mind. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a writer and I'm gonna write so that I can like land my next dream job or something. Like I'm gonna put my ideas out there in the world and through the course of that writing, like I'm gonna land a job. That was my idea, right? And so I've set, I made a commitment to myself. I was gonna write 500 words a day for 90 straight days and just see what happened. And at the time I was doing that writing on, of all places, LinkedIn. Again, I thought I was gonna be getting a job <laughs> through my writing. So I'm like writing on LinkedIn, I'm writing all these things about businesses and raising capital and building teams and starting a company and you know getting growth hacking, all these ideas like that any startup would, would probably be really interested in learning about. And someone at LinkedIn reached out to me. They're like, we really like what you're doing. Like, would you mind like testing one of these new features that we're rolling up the LinkedIn newsletter? And I was like, sure. Like, why not? Like, I'm already going to be writing anyway. Like why, why the heck not? So uh, I started, you know, testing out that feature, publishing every day. And over the course of three months, like grew my subscribership on LinkedIn from zero to 10,000 subscribers. So I was like, wow, like I just, I built an audience. Like that's cool. But I realized that the writing that I was doing wasn't attracting the type of people that I really wanted to surround myself with, number one. Number two, the people that were attracted to that content like were not the type of people that were able to help me grow and become a better person. And so after amassing an audience of 10,000 people on LinkedIn in three months, I switched over to Twitter where I had maybe 300 followers and just started from scratch. And for no reason other than I was thinking to myself, being a writer on LinkedIn is not the place for me. Maybe being a writer on Twitter is better. Um, and over the course of now nine months of writing every day on Twitter, <laughs> I have slowly grown an audience from 200, 300 to you know, a little over 3,000. And so not even halfway to the size of the audience that I had on LinkedIn, However, the people and the community that I'm a part of on Twitter, where we are exchanging ideas so quickly, where we're pushing each other to go further than we can think of going ourselves every day, where I constantly see people shipping cool new ideas, like podcasts and landing cool guests like Gary Vee, or like, I, I don't know, I love seeing these like these indie hackers just pushing out new tools and new products like every month and coming up with these new inventive ideas. Those are the type of people that inspire me to create more. And so I use this phrase, don't you know, find friends, not followers, because the follower account is a vanity metric. It might not be the one that really unlocks that superpower for you. And, um, and what I have found is the thing that does unlock those superpowers is making friends with like-minded people or other creative people that are just pushing the envelope every single day. Dude, I love that because it mirrors my own story in so many ways. And I didn't even know that part about the LinkedIn for you. But for me, what happened was I started talking about e-commerce in 2018 to 2019. And in the middle of 2019, I realized these aren't the type of people I want to hang around with. Some of them, you know, like this isn't what I want to be spending my time. This isn't energizing me and, and getting me to where I want to be. I need to stop doing this. It took me another, you know, nine months to figure out, okay, I need to start writing and getting my ideas out there so that I can start to clarify that. And so that I can start to make friends on Twitter with people with no expectations. And it's so interesting how for both of us, the first time we did it, it was strictly for followers. It was how can I gain an audience? How can I get people interested in me? How can I propel myself? And then the second time we did it, it was like, how can I propel others? How can I make friends? How can I help others get better? And it was less self-oriented and we've seen better results personally because of it. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting. And 
I, I think a lot of definitions and terminology are continuing to evolve in the creator economy. Um, but but I, I think what, I, what I'm more or less describing is, is one way to potentially juxtapose those two terms, influencer versus creator. Mm. And, and I think, I, I, again, like I, I'm not a huge fan of, of some of these terms because I think the definitions differ from person to person and that's completely okay. But at the end of the day, I, I wrote this article last year there's like there's there's two potential ways that you can build uh, an, an audience on Twitter, and these are two of the extremes. One way is what I would call you know build a fan page. It's like Cristiano Ronaldo, you know. He's like, I mean, everyone that is there is there to follow Cristiano, and if Cristiano posts something, everybody else is just interacting with Cristiano. Like, that's that's your fan page. I mean, the other way that you, the other extreme side of things, and there's a millionaire is shaded gray between, but the other side of the extreme is to build a community. And the community builders, uh, a small example might be like what Jack Butcher has accomplished with visualized value. But what you look for in someone that's building community, you go into their comments sections on a platform like Twitter, you don't see all of those people just interacting with Jack the way that all of Cristiano's fans only interact with Cristiano. What you see in a place like a community is you see other people going there into the comment sections to interact with other people, not just the you know influencer up at the top of that profile page. And I think that's what's really interesting, especially so in this creator economy, um, because a lot of those creators in those communities know and realize, I'm a solo entrepreneur, but I'll never be able to do it on my own. Like I need, I need my, my disciples. I need my wolf pack. I need my, whatever you want to call it. My sidekicks. I like that term a lot, but I need those people that I can grow with alongside of me. And you don't find those on, uh, on Kim, Kim Kardashian or Cristiano Ronaldo's pages. Yeah. It's what you're talking about reminds me of something that Gary Vaynerchuk did in the past couple of weeks, which was just, he posted on Instagram and said, Hey, this is a post for you guys to interact with each other and you guys to find services and say what you're about and some will respond. And that is exactly what you're talking about, using your platform to help bring others up. And I think that is something that you're trying to do. And that's something that I think I'm trying to do. And it's, it's something that is like, it's fulfilling and rewarding too. So that idea of, of like giving others the opportunity to shine is what it's all about. Yeah, I, I, there's this idea that I mess around with in my book and uh, it's this, so number one, uh, one of my favorite ideas that I pick apart in my book is this idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the idea that I pick apart in there is this idea that like, if I can dream it, if I can believe it, if I can see myself doing it, then I can plot the actions that are necessary to take to get to that point, to get there, you know? So Luol, wanted to build a video game, but there are no coding classes in Northern Uganda where Luol grew up. I mean, there's, there's, there, uh, Marcus Bullock wanted to build a mobile application, but like, there's no coding classes in prison. Like these, these, like, there's just no, no way for like these, these individuals to be able to achieve what they did. Um, except for the fact that they told themselves like, this is, this is my purpose. Like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do whatever it takes to figure out and plot my, like plot my steps there. So I pick apart that idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's this really interesting idea in sociology um, that's called the Pygmalion effect. And the Pygmalion effect is this idea that uh, if others believe in you, then it instills the confidence that you need to be able to achieve or create. So if others around you have high expectations, then you yourself will begin to develop some high expectations. Or if others are, you know, others around you are putting you down constantly, then you're going to put yourself down. Um, those are two really interesting and powerful ideas. Something that I didn't see until recently was this idea floating around on Twitter. Um, the idea is called belief capital. And the I, and what that means is when uh creator believes in another creator, it instills confidence in that person to keep creating. And so pulling all of those things together, I think is a really beautiful way to describe exactly what you were just describing, which is like part of the reason that I show up every single day 
to Twitter is because other people are inspiring me to want to create. And then the other people see me creating and that inspires them. And there's this cool kind of circle that's happening. And I think that this is a really powerful force. So take us through your first few days on Twitter. What, what was your first month on Twitter like? What was your mindset like? What, what type of, what were you thinking about? Obviously you're trying to make friends and not followers, but like, what did that look like practically for someone who might be on a similar place in their journey? Yeah. Um, I almost, I almost never check my Twitter stats, but at the end of the year, I went back and I was like, wow, let me like look at this and see like what happened this year. Um, Cause I was like interested in doing it as part of my own personal reflection. So what I, what I saw was for the first three, four months of the year, I, I didn't see that follower count move at all. Um, and then in like April or May, I saw that follower count drop like negative six or negative seven. So looking back on what I did last year for probably three or four months, I was just hanging out. I was just trying to like learn and see what was happening on Twitter. And what I realized was if you, uh, what you, what you consume uh, is, is, is a big part of like what you create. So when my follower account dropped in May, um, it was because I probably unfollowed like 2000 accounts and I unfollowed 2000 accounts because I wanted to have like the healthiest content consumption diet that I could possibly have. Um, and the moment I started to have a much healthier content uh, diet, what I ended up discovering was I was able to begin to develop my own voice. And I was able to learn from other people that, have de that had developed their own voice. I learned how to begin to develop mine. And there are a lot of ways that you could create prolific content on Twitter. I would not describe myself as a prolific tweeter but what i would say is starting in june or july i began to focus in on on a couple of of niches and one niche that i began to play around in is this idea that kindness itself is contagious and in a really really weird way on a platform like twitter what i mean by that is um when i began to spread kindness and positivity it began to come come back around almost like a boomerang and, and so I began to share like kind messages and those kind messages began to help me be recognized on Twitter for something, for something. I threw like a little, you know, message in my Twitter profile picture, like be kind. Mm -hmm. I started using this emoji, the blue heart to like mm -hmm. symbolize part of my personal brand. And through that people began to recognize me as someone who just spread positivity. And I think on a, on a platform like Twitter where most people who are not in our corner of the internet will most likely think of Twitter and think of a platform that is very hostile and combative in nature. And so I think by spreading positive vibes on a daily basis, it enabled me to you know, find a nice corner of the internet to begin to build in. And that's what I did. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking on that kindness, where does that come from? Like, are you, were you always the kindest dude in the room? Were, talk to me about your journey with kindness and why that has become such a big part of your brand. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, so the, there's probably a, a lot of different reasons why this is an important value to me. Yeah. Um, one of them, I was doing this like reflection exercise last year and the exercise that I was doing, it's this like very morbid exercise where like you imagine the way that people describe you like when you're dead, you know? And like, oh, it sounds like so morbid and I, I don't usually like thinking this way, but it's actually a very powerful exercise and here's why. When I, when I started to think about it, I began to realize like people are not going to care about where, what company Jamie worked at when he was 28 years old. Um, people are not going to remember my job titles. So if I'm going to introduce myself as Jamie, the guy that worked for this company with this job title that chased like this career ladder, like that's, that's not the way people are going to remember me when I die. Um, like it would be a much 
better message to be able to tell people like Jamie was a kind person. Hmm. And, and when I started to think about that, I started to think like, okay, like if, if that's, if that's what matters to me, or if that's how I want to be remembered, like, what are some small things? What are, what are some small things that I can do just to live out the, like fulfill that those values. And I, I've always been someone I've almost gotten every single place in my career that I've ever wanted to get um, through volunteering. Like, the e- like one of the easiest things we can do, uh, maybe not as easy during a global pandemic, but one of the easiest things we can do is volunteer our time. And I would go volunteer at places that like put me in these roles where I got to learn so much. And I leveraged those experiences of volunteering my time to like get to the next thing and the next thing. That was really cool. But in addition to that, like aside from volunteering time, like you can use social media in a different way. Like you can build a business in a, in a different way. You can uh, inspire people in different ways. And, and that's the type of energy that I wanted to bring to a platform like Twitter. Um, it's, it's really the first time that I've ever experimented with like productizing this, this value set through content. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think I'm still learning, I'm still learning a lot. Um, there, there's like some content that I've put out there that I love and I think is so true. And then there's other content that I've put out that like I look back and reflect on it. I'm like, was that, was that like kindness clickbait almost? Like, what am I, mm. what am I doing? So, so I think I'm like constantly trying to iterate and learn how I can like fulfill, fulfill that. Um, and, and I think you do a really phenomenal job of it. Thank you. Um, if going back to you though, if kindness is your North star, and we say kindness is your number one value. I'm curious, what are some of the things below that? What are two through five, or maybe just one or two that are, you would say this, I want to represent me. This is what I want to represent my brand. This is who I am. Yeah, I, I think a lot of them are interwoven into kindness. One of the very, very easy um, principles that I, I live by is you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. It's It's the golden rule like it's so easy to remind ourselves of that every single day and it's one of the most powerful ways to start building empathy and empathy to me is one of those highly elusive leadership principles that i mean the best the best leaders in the world are those that are able to put themselves in the shoes of others and and, and so for me, the, the easy way that I remind myself every day of that is treat others the way that you want to be treated. Another thing that's really, really important to me is the idea of like being comfortable in your own skin or not being afraid to be different, mm. carving your own unique path and coming back to that idea that I shared at the very beginning, like setting your own definition of what success looks like. Um, I, I liked writing on LinkedIn at the very, very beginning because I had the ability to hide behind a, a pretty impressive resume. Mm-hmm. I, I have achievements, I have degrees, I've got stuff that I thought was like projecting a certain version of myself out to the world that gave me the confidence to be able to present my, you know, present my ideas. When I came onto Twitter, I, 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 I didn't share a single thing with anyone about any credentials. None of that matters. Mm-hmm. Not, at the end of the day, none of that really matters. Some of those experiences were formative for me, but when I am coming onto a platform like Twitter and uh, I am beginning my career as a creator alongside an 18 year old kid that just graduated high school, like it doesn't matter. Like we're on an even playing field and, mm-hmm. and that, 18 year olds and I are just getting started at building our online reputations. And uh, that there's nothing that separates me from that individual and another individual and another, like what will separate me is the way that I present myself on that platform. And it doesn't, doesn't matter what the credentials are that I have. I need to bring the true authentic version of myself out Um, that will, you know, share to the world who I am. When did you come to this realization and why? Like, 
it was it would be very easy for you to start talking on Twitter about your credentials and your past or whatever. But you decided I'm going to start fresh. I'm going to start clean. It's not about the credentials. When did you come to the conclusion that it was not about the credentials and it was instead about expressing your authentic version of who you are? I think if anyone is starting a career as a creator, like know this, I I don't possess all the secrets, (laughs) but if you are interested in launching a career as a creator, you are the business. Like it is, it is you, it is not, it is not the degrees that you had. It's not the the network that you had. It's, it's not, you are, you are the business. And so I, I think that it is extremely powerful to be able to present your true authentic self, because if you are capable of doing that, it builds a moat through which no competitors will be able to pass. Nobody can steal my book from me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody can steal the Danny Miranda podcast from you. Mm-hmm. And all of that is a representation of who we are. So for me, I did not want to come in and compare credentials. There are people with 10,000 better credentials than I. It doesn't matter. What matters is what I create, how I create it, the message that that shares with others, uh, and the feeling that it, it the, the feeling and the emotions that make them feel. And, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm, I'm very early on in this journey. I, I don't, I, I don't have a, a blueprint or a playbook, but I'm just trying to continue to be uh, more and more and more of myself every single day. And with every essay, with every article, with every tweet, people get to learn a little bit more about me. How did you decide on writing and Twitter versus, you know, YouTube, you could have gone the route of TikTok, you could have gone a million different places, but you decided I want to be a creator on Twitter. Well, first you said LinkedIn, but how did you come to that conclusion of writing and Twitter? Yeah, yeah. I was starting from nothing a a year ago. And and I look the world the world was my oyster. I I had no skills. <laughs> I I've been work, I've worked in the corporate world for ten years. I've worked for someone else for ten years. I've developed skills that make me a good employee, mm. uh, but I haven't developed skills that enable me to carve my own path as a solopreneur. And there's a couple of interesting skills that I was like, you know, shoot like evaluating. Like, can I dive deep on design or video or writing? And for me, like the most comfortable medium for me is, is writing. Um, I, think, I think some people have an innate ability to present themselves on screen. And I, I, did, not, I, I did not possess that skill set whatsoever when I was starting. I, I, I wanted to write. Um, when it came to things like design, I mean, I was looking at other designers and I was looking and thinking to myself like, man, I could develop that skill set, but like, it just doesn't feel like who I am. So. I chose writing as a creative avenue to pursue because I, it was something that I enjoyed. It's something I liked doing. And it was something that I could see myself doing for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And thinking to myself, if this is something that I can stick with for five, 10, 15, 20 years, then it's, then it's something I can do and develop a, a bit of an advantage uh, around compared to other people that um, are writing for clickbait or writing for any other reasons that Um, may not be true and authentic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love how you took that approach of thinking about 5, 10, 20 years down the line, because I think that's the type of approach that you need if you want to be successful with anything as a creator. And if you think that it's just going to take a year, just going to take six months, or just going to be in in three weeks, you're going to be where you want to be. It's like, no, it's going to take a while and you might as well enjoy the journey while you're there. So switching gears a little bit, one of the things that I noticed when doing research for this conversation and just noticed in general was that you're big on accountability and particularly accountability calls and accountability is something so important to me and the role that it's played in my life. So I'm curious, what was the basis for starting these accountability calls? Talk to me about that and how that has affected your journey so far. Yeah. So I think 
last summer, amidst like getting started on Twitter, I, I had been having like a few fleeting interactions with a couple of people that I thought were, were really incredible human beings that were just getting started as well in their journey. And one of them like messaged me and looped in the other and we were like, why don't like, why are we doing, why don't we just like get on a call? <laughs> yeah. um, and those two people were uh, Andrew Yu and Robbie Crabtree. And like every week for the last nine months, like we haven't missed a call. Like there may have been a week. I mean, we literally through all of this thick and thin have just continued to jump on a weekly call to maintain accountability with one another. Not in like a, hey, Jamie, what are you gonna achieve this week? <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, did you accomplish what you wanted to last week? Not in that sense, um, but rather in the sense of like, here are a couple of things I'm thinking about. Um, like, help me help me work through which which you think is the best and, and why. Um, and uh, these these accountability calls for me are are less about um, maybe the accountability and and more about just developing tight feedback loops with your. Uh, you know, with the community. So it's been really, really helpful. I would say for anyone interested in setting up accountability calls, the, the one or two things that I think about, I oftentimes tell people like, find your sidekicks and your sidekicks are going to likely be people that um, are at a similar stage in the journey as you. So for me, it was people that had been on Twitter for like a month or two at that time. It was like, people who uh, were not exactly sure like what they were creating, but knew that they had the drive and the desire to like begin creating stuff. And so at that time, it was really helpful for me to find two, three, four or five other people because all together we were able to grow and we lift each other up. And it doesn't matter what's going on. Uh, Robbie is now doing incredible stuff with performative speaking. It was acquired by Beyond Deck. Andrew Yu is an incredible artist, a product manager, doing really cool stuff with some really interesting communities on the internet. And the three of us are now, you know, branching off in completely different directions, um, but that doesn't matter. Like we're, we're, all, we're all still able to push one another and like encourage each other to like not be afraid to send that cold email or, uh, or make an introduction or, you know, jump on a call and, and swap ideas. It's a super powerful thing. So how do you go about identifying that those are the people that you want to work on, work with? Is it just that they're at the same stage and same level? Or is there, are you looking for specific traits about them? Twitter is such an interesting platform because you really get an idea into someone's mind and you're reading someone's journal. So you really get to understand what they value. Is, is that part of it? How do you go about finding it's like dating. Like, it's literally like dating. It's like, you know, swipe right. Oh, like let's, <laughs> let's chat in the DMS um, for a little bit. And if it's, if it's, if it's good, like let's jump on a call and, and if the call is good, um, like maybe let's set up another call, you know, like I, 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 I network in such a different way post COVID than pre COVID. Like mm -hmm. I feel like the traditional sense of networking was, at least for me, like highly transactional. And I hated it. You walk into a, you walk into a room or an event and everyone's like shaking hands and exchanging business cards and like trying to figure out like how they can extract some value from you in that 30 second interaction. Mm. Like it's terrible versus Twitter. Like you get a feed of that person's brain. Like you, you have the ability to look inside of their heart in a way. If, if, people are not putting themselves out there on Twitter. I, I'm not as interested in getting to know them. And so like, I love seeing people like putting themselves out there, constantly exchanging ideas. And, you know, I'll jump into the DMs, jump on a call and then just keep going if it's, if it's good. You made such an interesting point about pre-COVID versus post-COVID. And I think it touches on something that is really a truth that in some way the world has gotten more authentic and more real post COVID. And I'm wondering if you've also thought that to be true and, and if so, how is that manifested? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting thing because it is something I actually had the opportunity to research for my book. And it's this idea that during difficult times, 
one of the most important things to get people through is social connection. And there are a lot of studies that back this idea up, especially around this concept of post-traumatic growth, where people go through some of the most difficult adversities in life and come out the other end even stronger than they once were. And one of the things that gets people through difficult times is a mentor or a close group of friends or this feeling that we're all going through something together, whether it is uh, Hurricane Katrina or a, a campus shooting. Uh, these, these traumatic, traumatic events can sometimes bring people closer. Hmm. And through that, all of them collectively are able to come out stronger than they were. So I think we're all experiencing a bit of that at the moment. I think it is, yes, enabling us to share our true authentic selves even more on the internet because we are all building this social connection with random strangers. Um, but what's cool about it is like, you know, sure, like for as many people that may be out there trying to take advantage of others right now, there are far more people that I have come across that are trying to use this as an opportunity to grow. Um, so that's, that's, that's my two cents on that, Danny. I love it. I love it. And I, I've also experienced the same from my perspective. Before we wrap this conversation up, I want you to talk a little bit about Jamie Market Fit because this is such an awesome term. And your, your idea of constant experimentation is just something that I think more creators and more people should hear about. So how have you gone about thinking about this term and what have you experimented with and what types of things have you experimented with? I think when any creator is getting started, like the content that they produce or the information that they share or the ideas that they have, it's like taking a step from right to left, from right to left that like is so far apart from like where they want to be that with every step of their journey, they're getting like closer and closer and closer to like their true authentic self. And the idea of Jamie Market Fit is this idea that like there are a lot of things that I am passionate about. Um, I, I write I write about people in my book and I try to unpack their mindsets. In a lot of my essays, I write about business as a force for good and positive change in the world. On Twitter, I talk about kindness uh, mm -hmm. and finding friends and not followers. There's all of these ideas that I have, um, but I think over the course of the next six, 12, 18, 24 months, I'm going to become narrower and narrower and narrower in the scope of, through which I write. And the way that I do that is by following the signals of the internet. Like if there are some ideas that are just popping off on social media and people are like, damn, we love that, like more, <laughs> then I'm gonna deliver it, you know? Like, <laughs> like so to speak, I, I mean, I, I don't wanna deliver a clickbait, but like I, I'm reading through the tea leaves to figure out what, what I love that the world and the internet equally loves so that I can carve out my corner of something um, in that beautiful overlapping circle of a Venn diagram. Yeah, and I think it's gonna be interesting to look back on five years because when you are on this path of understanding and trying to figure out what is the right path for you, it all seems obvious in hindsight, right? It all seems like, wow, that that's obviously what I should have been doing. And I'm sure we noticed parts of that in this conversation. I'm sure we noticed parts of that in your book and or on your tweets. But when we have the benefit of hindsight, we'll be able to be like, oh yeah, of course it makes perfect sense. Or of course I went off the path a little bit over here. So I love it, man. I think you're doing great work and I love, I, I'm just really excited to see where this journey lies. So before it, we close here, I'd love for you to drop a little bit of wisdom for anyone pursuing the highest version of themselves mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, whatever it may be, talk to that person and drop that wisdom here. Yeah. So in 2018, like I, I burned out hard. This was before we work. This was, I was working full time nine to five. I was going to school at night, three days a week. I was involved in a number of extracurricular activities that 
pretty much meant like I had not even a minute in any week for me, for myself. And I had everything, everything in my life, like from the outside looking in, everyone was like, Jamie's got it. He's got it all. And yet I felt so empty and sick inside and it was causing my mind to just spin and and it was something that I had such a hard time figuring out like what it was like what was happening um so thankfully I like went I got help I saw a therapist and he was like Jamie WTF like what are you doing why are you doing all of this like like can't you like make some time for yourself like why don't you take tomorrow off and just like go for a walk <laughs> and I was like I was like, is that it? Like, is that, is that what's going to help me? And, and it was the God's honest truth. Like I thought I was chasing this version of success that like, according to what society tells you is successful. Um, like I was, I was chasing that and I was on this, you know, hamster wheel, couldn't, couldn't get off. And so I took a step back and what I ended up doing was decommitting myself from a number of things. And figuring out like what it was that was going to make me happy. Um, and what I discovered was like, it wasn't going to be following the path that everyone else thought I should be following. It was going to be creating my own. And so for the last two years, I've just been taking small steps day by day to figure out what that is. Um, I think what's beautiful about those experiences in that journey is we may never find, like, we never may never find it, but if we're taking the steps each and every day to find it, I, I think our chances are pretty high. Um, so my, my advice to anyone is, like, don't be deterred from, like, creating what you want to create and carving your own path. Like, all of us have the power inside of ourselves to do it and follow it and carve our own. Um, for me, like the purpose of my book is to show everybody, no matter who you are, or where you're from or what you want to be, you can do it. Um, and I may not have all the answers, but I, I bet if you do some soul searching, you'll, you'll find them yourself. I got to ask a follow-up question on that, which is when did you realize that you needed to seek help? It, oh man. Um, it just felt like I hit rock bottom. Like hmm. I, it, it, it's hard to know like where our limits are, but I hadn't slept in like three nights and I wasn't sure like what the heck was going on with me. I thought I was losing my mind. And so I thought like the, the solution that I had heard about or known about or like was, deeply innerly like seeking was just like, I really just needed to talk to a professional. Like I, mm. I just needed to seek professional guidance. Um, you know, I could, I could talk, I think I'd talk to my parent. I'd talk to my mom. Like I called my mom. I was like, mom, I don't know what the heck is going on. Like, I think I'm losing my mind. Like, can you come down and visit me? Like, what? and she did. And that didn't help. Like, I was like, what is wrong with me? Um, and ended up going, you know, to seek professional help and whew, within like, within one or two sessions. I, I know this is not the way that it happens for everybody, but for me, it was like one or two conversations. And I was like, man, like I, I've just let this spiral out of control for so long. And, and I, I have the ability to control this. I, I can, you know, quit X, Y, and Z. I can make time for me. I can do, do this stuff. And I'm, I'm very lucky that I have, you know, have the ability to do that. Um, so that's what I did. But yeah, I don't, it, it just, you know, you feel like you, you're at a point where the only, the only thing you can do is just like speak to someone else that knows, knows what they're doing, like understands the mind because it's, it's something that oftentimes like we, we don't learn about, they don't teach you about, um, but it's such a, it's such an important muscle to take care of. The importance of just telling someone and talking to someone about it and that non-judgmental frame and that the knowledge that that person has on the other end as a psychologist or a therapist is like it's next level it's real and it it can change lives and we're certainly my life is certainly better off for your therapist and 
giving you that opportunity to speak and get that out of your mind because I'm better off for having my life's better off for you being in it. So I'm grateful for you, man. I'm grateful that that rock bottom led to where you currently are today because you're doing great service for the world. Where can people find you if they want more Jamie after this conversation? Uh, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hang out on Twitter. So uh, feel free to follow me at Jamie Russo, J-A-M-I-E-R-U-S-S-O. Uh, my website is jamierusso.me. Um, that's the place you can go find my book, The Underdog Paradox. Danny, thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you.